Hey everyone, thank you for attending my presentation. Uh, my name is Carl Orzachowski and I'm the content director for Faunalytics. Uh, Faunalytics uh, is our name and it says a lot about what we do. We love animals and we love data and research and analytics. Faunalytics. We're an NGO with one overarching mission to make the animal advocacy movement more effective through the use of research and data. We do that through an original research program where we collect our own data and conduct our own analyses. Uh, we do it through our research library where we take research in the social sciences, natural sciences, our, uh, and other fields that relate to animal advocacy, and we summarize those studies for a lay audience. And finally, we do it through the creation of other resources like videos, infographics, and more. Uh, as the content director, the majority of the visual resources are created by me. Um, so in this talk, uh, I want to discuss some of the biggest problems that we have in communicating the plight of animals to the general public and the ways that data and visualization can help to address some of those problems, or in the cases that it can address those problems, uh, to at least raise awareness about them. Since the outlier talks are pre-recorded, uh, I can't really get a sense of this before I speak, so I'm going to assume that the majority of the people attending this talk uh, are not part of the animal movement. Um, and that you're not necessarily well-versed in animal advocacy issues or debates within the movement. Uh, if you are already familiar with this stuff, then that's great. Um, some of the things that I'm going to discuss are already going to be in your wheelhouse, and hopefully what I'm talking about will apply to the work you may already be doing alongside of organizations like ours. Broadly, I'm going to discuss three types of problems that the animal movement has that data can help to solve or raise awareness of. To be clear, these aren't the only problems that exist in animal advocacy, uh, very far from it. However, they are persistent problems, and each broad set of problems has many sub-problems under its umbrella. The first and maybe biggest problem that the animal movement has to deal with is the problem of scale. So simply put, the vast majority of people uh, in the world are not really aware of the scale at which we use animals in our everyday lives. If you ask someone how many animals we consume each year, they may say something like, a lot. Um, but that is an understatement. And if you ask them for a specific number, they will probably really lowball it. Um, in 2018, which is the last year that we have statistics for from the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, we slaughtered over 71 billion land animals, most of them chickens. Um, that's about 10 animals per person per year globally. Obviously, some people consume less or none at all. Some people consume many more. Um, and that number doesn't even count the many billions and some estimate over a trillion fishes uh, that we slaughter every year for food. Uh, here we run into already a sub-problem and that it's hard to quantify the number of fishes that we slaughter for food each year because the statistics that we do gather measure them in live weight rather than as individuals. Uh, as a side note, imagine if we did that for people. So for example, imagine you know turning on the news and somebody saying, at the presidential inauguration this past week, there were 55,275,000 pounds of human in attendance. Um, that calculation is assuming 300,000 people, 50-50 men and women, with the average US male weight at 197.9 pounds and the average US female weight at 170.6 pounds. Um, it sounds weird, right? Uh, it's a rather cold and indifferent way to sum up a crowd, and it's something animal advocates come up against all the time, every day. In each of these cases, animal advocates are charged with the task of communicating a vast scale of suffering and death to a general public that is mostly unaware. Uh, and our animal use doesn't stop there. In addition to using animals for food, we use them for clothing, uh, though many of those are byproducts of the food industry, uh, we use them for experimentation, we use them for our entertainment, and, and so many other uses. With these problems of scale, it's not hard to see how data visualization can make our jobs as animal advocates easier. In the last few years, I've made visualizations for faunalytics that show, for example, how global slaughter numbers break down. There's a chart right there. And here's an alternate view. I've made visualizations that bring fish into the equation and you can see how skewed things get. There's another visualization right there. 
And I've used DataViz to talk about other issues related to our scale of animal use, such as a cross comparison of the weight of chickens at slaughter and their age at slaughter. As you can see from this chart, over the years, we've been killing chickens earlier and earlier in their lives. In those shorter lives, however, they are getting heavier and heavier. Um, this means that a chicken might be slaughtered now uh, at just a few weeks old or, you know, four to six weeks old, uh, but they actually are heavier than they would have been if they lived for two years uh, in, you know, in a previous time. The next problem is mostly internal to the animal movement, although it's also common among many nonprofit organizations in general. So if you're not necessarily part of the animal movement uh, or other nonprofit work, this is an inside glimpse. Um, and it boils down to a couple of key questions. How do we do our work as efficiently as possible? And how do we make the most positive change for animals with the fewest resources possible? Uh, since resources, or I mean, I can just say money, uh, are all, is always in short supply. Well, uh, developing effective strategies in animal advocacy often involves setting aside advocating for, you know, perfect moral action uh, in order to understand what actually works in practice. It's really only in the last 10 years or so that the animal movement has really even been interested in measuring its effectiveness. And I'm proud to say that Faunalytics is, you know, we've been at it for 20 years and we were one of the first organizations to try to quantify this and to push it forward as an important thing to do. Thanks to this turn towards data, our movement has started to conduct its own high quality research and generate its own reliable data on questions that are strategically pertinent. So for example, one of the biggest debates in animal advocacy is whether we should advocate for veganism as a baseline or whether we should adopt an incrementalist approach and encourage people through activities such as Meatless Monday uh, or other similar initiatives, promoting flexitarianism and more. Here, DataViz can help to underline why being flexible in our advocacy can have big dividends for animals. So for example, it's traditionally been very, very hard to get people to go vegan. Let's say by some gargantuan feat of effort, you personally managed to get 100 people to change their diet to be animal product free. Well, thanks to our own data, uh, we know that 84% 80, of vegans and vegetarians go back to eating some amount of animal products in the first two, within the first two years of becoming vegetarian or vegan. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for that recidivism, but either way, it's a bummer and it's something that the movement has to address. So in the end, you're left with 16 vegans eating three animal productless meals a day. In a year, those 16 vegans will have eaten 17,520 animal productless meals. Now let's say you convince 100 people to participate in Meatless Mondays, and let's say for the sake of argument, uh, they're not just eating meatless meals, but they're eating vegan ones. Um, getting 100 people to not eat animal products uh, every Monday is a lot easier to do than getting 100 people to go vegan and then watching a whole bunch of them go back to eating meat. Um, meatless Mondays are a pretty easy thing to stick with, so let's say all 100 people stick with it for a year. That group of 100 relatively low commitment folks will have eaten 15,600 uh, animal productless meals over the course of the year, uh, which is very close to the number of meals that uh, the vegan group would have eaten. When you start to bring in other meat reduction strategies into the equation, like blended meats, for example, uh, it's easy to see how strategic incrementalism can have very big dividends for animals. Uh, especially with people who would quite simply never go vegan. Recently, Faunalytics released a massive study on the impact of different animal product formats. Uh, that's a weird word, I know, but basically think of the difference between things like breaded chicken nuggets and chicken shreds. Uh, we compared products like this to get a better understanding of how small shifts in what we eat can make a big difference in terms of the days of suffering we cause, or the number of lives we take each day for our food. Uh, here's a bit of what we found. This chart shows us the top 10 impactful products for reducing lives taken. So in our calculations, we factored in things like serving size and the popularity of a given product, along with slaughter statistics and mortality rates. And what we found was pretty incredible. So for example, if we could get the US population to skip pork, lunch, and meat, Okay, 
just that one type of meat product and to not replace it with any other type of meat. We could save 3.3 million lives per day. This next chart looks at the top 10 impactful products for reducing days of suffering and finds that if we all just skipped scrambled eggs and omelets and didn't replace them with other animal products, we would spare 201 million days of suffering for each day that we abstain from those scrambled eggs and omelets. Um, we did this calculation by, of course, factoring in the length of lives of chickens, how many eggs go into a typical serving, and the amount of scrambled eggs and omelets that are eaten every day in the US. Um, so it's really easy to see how a really small change like that and asking people to shift their diet in a really small way and not replace that shift with another animal product leads to a, a just a massive amount of change. The last problem that I want to talk about is one that many of you might be familiar with in your own field, and that's a lack of data, uh, an abundance of bad data, or hard to extrapolate data. Um, I call this uh, the problem of data opacity. So basically the animal movement deals with this too. In some cases we deal with a lack of data because governments often don't mandate the gathering of statistics for different kinds of animals. So uh, for example, in the US, when it comes to animals used in laboratories, only animals that fall under the purview of the Animal Welfare Act have to be counted. That only includes large animals like primates, cats, dogs, um, and other smaller or medium-sized mammals. Um, meanwhile, the vast majority of the animals that actually get used in laboratory experiments, and those are birds, rats, mice, and fish, uh, do not legally need to be counted, so um, we have to estimate how many of them are used each year. Just a couple of weeks ago, actually, a study was published that extrapolated that about 111.5 million of these hidden animals per year are used in experiments in the U.S. annually. That's a staggering number of animals who not only are not counted, but also who have no legal protections when it comes to their welfare. Scientists can pretty much do whatever they want with them, and their lives do not even have to make it to a spreadsheet to be counted. And in fact, there's uh, other recent studies that have come out that talk about um, the number of animals that are actually used in experiments versus the number of those experiments that actually result in a published paper and uh, you know the amount of animal lives that are essentially wasted for no, for no real purpose. It's, it's staggering and it's very sad. In other cases, so such as with the issue of puppy mills, we have a somewhat similar problem. In this case, it's not so much that the government doesn't mandate the gathering of statistics. I mean, for the record, they don't. Um, it's that the practice is so unregulated. You know, animal experimentation is highly regulated. Um, puppy breeding is very, very unregulated. People do it in their backyards. Uh, most puppy mills are kind of backyard operations. Um, and it's also a practice that's unknowingly supported by so many people who choose to uh, shop for a pet rather than adopt a pet from a local shelter. There simply isn't the political will or the infrastructure to gather this amount of data at scale. What we do know is that the practice is widespread and DataViz can help uh, us to define some of the contours of the problem. So uh, thanks to data gathering uh, from organizations like uh, the Humane Society of the US, uh, we have some sense of what the industry looks like and you can see that from this chart up here. And even in other cases, such as with the issue of the illegal wildlife trade, what we know for sure is what we're able to catch. In other words, we have statistics on the number of seizures of illegal wildlife parts or live animals made worldwide on any given year, and we have a sense of the dollar value of these seizures. But what we don't know is the true scale of the trade and how many animals and parts are traded underground without being caught. So as you can probably tell from this talk and the nature of the visualizations that I do and that I've shown you, um, I'm an advocate first and a data viz person second. Uh, I'm amazed by people who have the skills and ability to create visualizations that are more complex, that have a greater statistical depth, um, but almost more than their skills, I envy the completeness of the data sets that they have to work with. The great news is, if you have a passion for data viz, 
The animal movement is growing and needs people like you to help us communicate to the world that the plight of animals is an emergency, uh, and it's one of enormous scale. Our movement needs people like you to help us evaluate our strategies and determine how some strategies that seem intuitively effective may not be. And our movement needs people like you to help us understand the data we do have and dig up the data we don't. I think all of us are here because we know that DataViz has the potential to reach and inform a broad audience and to meet people where they are. We live in an increasingly gra graphic-driven online space, uh, and anything we can do to translate data into a form that people can understand is a great step forward. So if this gives you a hankering to volunteer with Faunalytics, uh, please get in touch with me anytime. This is my email address, carl at faunalytics.org. Um, and I appreciate you coming to my virtual talk. Uh, thanks so much. I think we are going to now trans transition to a live Q&A. Um, I probably won't be sitting against the same wall for the Q&A, so you're about to see me fade into some other different type of uh, background. Uh, but I look forward to hearing the questions that you have. And uh, thank you again.